think that nuclear reactor can explode. Pressurized water reactors cannot explode. They have a specific design to be very stable in there. Okay, so how about the weapon? How does the bomb actually happen? How is it built? So typically, there's many different designs to cause and to produce a nuclear explosion, but the most common one, if you take a plutonium sphere, okay, which is about something like 20 centimeters or 10 centimeters big, whole sphere, empty inside, okay, and uh, you put this very specialized explosive round. Okay. So in the beginning, this plutonium is too thin for this chain reaction to really increase. So if a neutron comes in and slams into a piece of, uh, piece of uh, plutonium, Maybe one or two neutrons will come out, but it's so thin that most neutrons will go through. This will be a dying out process. Okay? This will be like a subcritical kind of a process. It's stable, it can sit, nothing happens. But how do you get it to, how do you get this K minus one to become positive? Okay. So remember I said two things. It depends on materials. No, you cannot change the material. You built a bomb, you're not going to change materials. It depends on geometry. Geometry can change very well. So how do you change the geometry of this thing very fast and very subtle? What you do is like, explosives are there for a reason. You cause the explosives to detonate in a very kind of spherically uniform manner. Okay? So it causes a detonation, and this pushes the pit. This this uranium thing is called a pit, or is um, into a much smaller size, and it becomes a lot thicker. So remember that analogy between thin uranium and thick uranium. Now when the neutrons come in, they cause a fission, which then more replicate, it replicates itself, and K minus one becomes highly positive. So suddenly, what was a dying out process becomes violently explosive, and it rises extremely fast. Okay? And uh, you end up at this enormous rise. This is actually the time scale. Okay? So this is on microseconds. I apologize for tiny labels over here. But basically, if you do the analysis, you take this thing, you calculate you know, how long does it take for the number of the fissions to be equal to the number of the nuclei inside this pit, you find out that it takes only 0 0.6 seconds. You end up burning is all of this plutonium in 0 0.6 seconds. That's an enormous amount of energy released in a tiny amount of time. Okay. So you had this, this, uh, as a result of this, this plutonium becomes extremely hot. The temperatures rise to higher than the temperature of the, uh, inside the core of the sun. Okay. Humans have been able to achieve temperatures that are higher than temperature inside the sun. Not outside, outside the sun is cold. Inside the sun, 100 million degrees. Okay. So at this point, this whole thing detonates. And all this energy is released in very short amount of time. So this is like the basic principle of how a fission bomb works. So how about the fusion bomb? I told about the fact that you know fission bombs are incredibly powerful, but they can be even be more powerful if you use another process. So I talked about this, you know, the breakup. Fission means essentially breakup. In the, the term I, I wrote down in, uh, in the Russian in, in Armenian. By the way, I forgot to say. The, speak, the talk is in, in English, but if you do not understand something what I'm saying, let's say because of the terminology I'm using, just raise your hand, or I'll translate, or someone can translate. There's actually excellent experts here who know things actually better than I do. Um, so fission means breakup, bajanum or zileni in Russian, right? Fusion means synthesis. Like Russian equivalent is synthesis, but basically means joining things together, right? Or German, 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 German synthesis. So if you take two nuclei and force them together, which is not easy because we have electric, electrostatic repulsion, they have the same charge, so they will repel. But if you somehow force them together or get, to, get them to go so fast that when they run into each other, their repulsion is not enough to stop them, they come close together and their nuclear forces cause them to attract and they slam into each other. And in the process, there's, you can also release energy in that way. So you can release energy by breaking down uranium and you can release energy for putting light elements like deuterium, tritium, helium, lithium aside, uh, together, right? And that's essentially how the sun works. The core of the sun, most of the young, the young stars are made out of uh, helium that, you know, that, that, uh, that, that interact with, with each other, with deuterium, tritium, lithium, and they produce heavier and heavier nuclei until they run out of this, and then the star dies, you have a ring. So the sun is one example, and you can also use this to produce thermonuclear explosions. So I won't go too much into the details of how exactly. So how so how do we how do you do this like okay we sort of figure out how it works the reason it works in the sun. 
the temperatures are so high that those that those these things are moving so fast that they totally overcome the electrostatic repulsion, slamming each other, and nuclear forces take uh, take over. They stick together. They release energy. But how do you do it on on Earth? So well, remember what I said about nuclear weapons in the previous slide that it gets to 100 million degrees, like the core of the sun. Aha! Uh -huh, so you can use that, right? Essentially, the thermonuclear weapon is consists of itself of a basic nuclear weapon on top, and this material, which is typically lithium dihydrate, so it's lithium and um, deuterium, simply because it's easy to make. Because of detonation in what's called a primary, this produces lots of X-rays, which cause ablation on the secondary, and basically force the, uh, compress the secondary, and force the temperature of the secondary to go to 100 million degrees. At that point, you ignite fission, and you have this enormous detonation. Essentially, the belief is that these things can be made arbitrarily large. If the weapon dropped in Hiroshima was 20 kilotons, the Tsai bomb of Bomba, which was built by Sakura, was 50 megatons. And there were talks that you could go to a gigaton. Essentially, like, you can keep adding this fuel in all directions and keep burning and burning. Um, so how big are the bombs? Uh, like, lots of people that I talk to when they talk about nuclear weapons, because they are so powerful, people think they must be enormous the size of this building. They're actually fairly small. So these are what the first bombs look like. Okay. This is uh, the Fat Man. This is the, the actual bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Uh, the, this is actually, this cell over here is Ramsey, Norman Ramsey. I mentioned him earlier. Do you know who Norman Ramsey is? Who uses GPS here? <laughs> I do. Only two of us? Nobody else uses GPS in Armenia? <laughs> uh, GPS works because of this guy over here. He developed the atomic clocks, the concept of atomic clocks, which people put in GPS satellites, which allows them to very precisely calculate time, and then that is used to reconstruct your position on the planet. On, on, on the planet. So every time you use your cell phone, you go to, I don't know, think Alianos or somewhere, you, know, you are, you know, you know, that's because of this cell phone. So th this bomb was about five tons, right, which is fairly big, it seems like. This is the first, well, this is a model, not the real thing. The model of the first thermonuclear bomb, okay, called Castel Bravo, it weighed about 10 tons. It was actually never fueled it because it's very hard to deliver uh, a 10 ton bomb. Fairly big. Okay. Well, how big are they today? This is like in the 40s and 50s. How big are the bombs today? So they are fairly small. So this thing, uh, calling it my TV picture, this is again, it's not the real thing, this is like the model of it, right? It's about, it's hard to read, but it's 20, uh, no, 40 centimeters big, it's this big. It's 20 kilograms, like most of us can carry. It comes with a backpack, so special forces soldiers can carry it and detonate it somewhere. And it has enough, it's enough power, it's about less than what was, uh, what the Hiroshima bomb was, what this was actually quite about. So terrorists this can carry this. Of course, everyone can carry it. We can carry it too. Uh, this is even smaller. Okay? This is an artillery shell. They were able to stick a nuclear weapon inside an artillery shell and shoot it from cannon. Okay? This is, you know, it's almost like a rocket propelled grenade. It's not a second bigger. This is like a French officer. He's inspecting a uh, recoilless rifle, is the technical term, with uh, basically the same weapon as this one, a different form. They're tiny. They're extremely small. And something to realize about nuclear weapons when you think about can someone develop a nuclear weapons? Nuclear weapons are 1940s technology. Okay. Like, this is probably newer technology than in terms of time. The complexity is different, of course. Um, so, this is the, but, okay, these are the, what I call fission bombs. This is like regular nuclear bombs. How about those thermonuclear bombs that can be made enormously powerful? This is how big they are. Okay. This bomb over here is W80 warhead. It's 150 tons of TNT equivalent. Like a whole row I'm sitting over here, and these guys are very bored with the guys are testing each one. Essentially, the primary that they talk about is over here, the regular bomb, and the secondary um, uh, fuel is in the second bomb. This bomb is about, um, what is it, six times, seven times more powerful than the So they're extremely small, but they have been made smaller and smaller and smaller. For the obvious reasons. Why? Why do you want to make your bomb so small? Because it's not enough to have a bomb. You have to drop it. You have to deliver it. So the whole process of delivery is actually quite more complex than making the bomb itself. Making the bomb is just the first step. You also have to figure out ways to how to do it. So there's, at this point, you know, I won't go into the details of how things have evolved, uh, the history of that, but there are three main ways in which, let's say, Russia, United States, and Britain have their arsenal packed, you know, uh, completely. There's three main ways. One of them is intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, mixed by uh, by the speaker here, which can be done by Strategic bombers, like this 295, 
for which can fly very long distances at very high altitude. And also in the 60s and 70s, people came up with ways to launch these missiles from under the water in submarines. Okay. There's a whole story as to why people had to do with submarines. Had to do with deterrence, with the, you know, with the way nuclear war would play out, and things like that. What are the delivery times? I mean, this one's already slow, but how long does it take to deliver, to launch this one for it to arrive to its location? Depends where you launch it from, where it gets, but something like no more than half an hour. You know, if one from the launch, it arrives at half an hour. Which means that if the opposite side has a warning system, which are typically very large arrays of radars, they have at most 15 minute warning that something is coming attack. So you can imagine the situation. They have got Russian sitting on their side, Americans sitting on their side, they're constantly watching the other side. And if something happens, okay, it's, if you think that there's an attack, you have 15 minutes before these bombs start blowing up next to you. So you have to make a decision very quickly. You have to transfer information to the president, who is the only person who can offer us a counter strike. Okay? And the president has minutes to make decisions. Something like estimated 10 minutes to make a decision, which ultimately might result in the extermination of humanity, as I'll show later. It okay? will result in a destruction much bigger than anything humanity has ever seen. So the real problem with this is, it's not only the fact that nuclear war is horrible. What is even more horrible is that there's a risk of accidental nuclear war. One side might think that they're being attacked. And this has really happened. And they are, might launch an attack on the, uh, basically a uh, retaliatory strike on the other side because they think that they're being attacked. So you can imagine essentially extreme, you know, mass murder which is committed by mistake, by simple oh, so well. What's that? False alarm. By false alarm, exactly. This is about false alarm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the time. And has this happened before? Has it come close to rest? Oh yes. It has come to close to this a bunch of times. I mean, we are like there has been at least four cases where either Americans thought that they were being under a massive attack, or the Soviets thought they were being under a massive attack. And it was almost a matter of luck that at some last minute they understood that okay, something is wrong and we should come down and not you know, escalate this. Uh, and in fact, one of the times when this happened in Soviet Union was under the rule of Andropov, who was extremely suspicious of the Americans. And people believe that if he had heard the thing, he would have probably started the, started the war. Okay, 